So with that, I'm going to go before the Lord and I'm going to pray because I need prayer. Why are you amen? You need it too. Let's pray together. Amen. Father, we come before you and we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here tonight. Lord, we're just so grateful and so glad that we get to come into the house of the Lord. And I said tonight, it is still morning. Praise Jesus for morning. Lord, we thank you that we don't come to hear from a man, don't come to fulfill ritual or tradition. Lord, we come to hear from you. And we ask today, Lord, that your spirit, your Holy Spirit would speak to us today as we look into your words, oh, Father, that we would understand your will, your desire for our lives. And God, we just ask that you would speak to each and every person that's in this place through your word, your desire for us. And Lord, that we walk out of this place encouraged and equipped to be and to do what you've called us to do. And Lord, we give you that praise and the honor. And Lord, we thank you that you would bless all the churches across the Inland Empire today that are meeting, Lord, and around the world. Lord, we thank you that we are all part of one body. That is the body of Christ, and we all serve our part in that body. Lord, we thank you that you would bless them, you would speak to them, Holy Spirit, move upon them. Lord, we ask that you continue to see growth across the inland empire of the churches everywhere, not just us, but all all, all over, Lord. And we thank you that it be your will be done, Lord, your kingdom come on on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' mighty name, we all together said, Amen. Amen. I feel the odd need to introduce myself. Um, If you don't know who I am, my name's Pastor Luke. I'm our um, executive pastor. A guy asked me between the services at the back door. He's like, who are you? And I'm like, just like, I was like, you remember that movie, Number Two? Oh. Like, Number Two, right? Like, that's me. So, except for I don't have an eye patch. Um, that's what I am. So my name's Luke. I'm our executive pastor. I'm also part of our teaching team. I'm glad to be with you today. Now that you can't even think about that. All right. If you got your Bibles, go with me to the book of Hebrews in the 11th chapter. Hebrews in the 11th chapter. I talked about the subject that we don't always want to talk about. It's a subject that's difficult. It's a subject that it's not fun to talk about. It's not one of those things that when we read it, if you're like me, and I, I venture to think you're like me, in the sense that if you've ever read this passage of scriptures before, or today as it's the first time maybe you'll read it, you're not going to jump out of your chair and thank God for the revelation that you're going to receive today. I just, just, it's okay, all right? This is just the human reaction. Today we're going to talk about the subject of godly discipline. Dun, dun, dun. Right. Some people are like, amen, the guy next to me. No, okay. Um, we're going to talk about that. And the reason I want to say we don't, want, we don't talk about it a lot is because I think oftentimes what happens is we end up putting a perspective on God and we understand a characteristic of God based on our experiences in life. And that's why so often when we think of discipline, when we think of, uh, of correction as it, as it is in the Bible, we, we put our own life experience into that. And we read things of, you know, things like God is a God of wrath and God is justice and his venge- vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And we get these, these images of what God is. But I want to today, as we look at this subject uh, in Scripture, I want to point out the character and the nature and the attributes of God to us and for us so that we can have a better understanding of a, of, a, of a subject that's so often difficult for us to grab a hold of and difficult for us to really take in in our own lives. I want to start by saying I, I've heard many times, and I'm sure that almost every person here today has asked this question in one form or another. But I remember hearing a man say, Pastor... I think God is punishing me. You see, my wife left me. I just lost my job. And none of my friends want to talk to me anymore. And I think that every person, if we're honest with ourselves, we look at our lives, we reflect back on things that have happened, experiences that we've gone through, maybe sicknesses in our body or or a family member, um, something happened to a family member, and we say, is God punishing me? And it's a hard question because God is this God of love. God is this God who, who showers blessings upon us. And why would God do anything to hurt me in my life? And it's a hard subject to grab a hold of. And we're going to look at that subject today. We're going to look at that question today. And normally what we do is we study Hebrews line upon line, precept upon precept, is we'll kind of take a line or we'll take a precept. But today, in order to understand the context of what's being said, I'm going to take you through eight verses. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at these verses in more depth. But I'm going to give you basically an overview of what's being said. Now, before I even give you an overview, I want to give you an overview of the overview. Because we've been in Hebrews for like six years. And sometimes, you know, have you heard that statement? Like, you don't see the forest through the trees? Like, what is Hebrews even about, right? Like, because every day, like, it, it, we, we spent eight weeks on running the race. 
Y'all got to just run the race, okay? All right, okay. So what is Hebrew all about? So listen, let's, let's talk about this before. Let me give you an overview of what Hebrews is about. Uh, many theologians, many scholars believe that aside from the book of Romans, Hebrews is probably one of the most theological, uh, theologically heavy or impacting books in the New Testament. Why? Because uh, Pastor Deborah reminded me, it talks about the preeminence or the authority or the greatness, the better uh, position of Jesus Christ. Contextually, what is Hebrews? We don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. We know when it was written. It was probably written about 60 AD. So this would be about 30 years after Jesus died on the cross. This book was written to Hebrew believers. What does that mean, Hebrew believers? In this time, in this age, Jewish believers are people who were raised in Judaism and found themselves believing in Jesus. They did not convert from Judaism to Christianity. They were Jewish believers of Jesus. But in the time, categorically speaking, under the Roman Empire, the Jews were protected. They were allowed to worship how they worshiped. Why? Because they were a feisty bunch of people. You want to know that? Read your Old Testament, you'll understand. They would rather die than give up their rights. So they were a feisty bunch of people, and the Jews had a very special privilege in the Roman Empire. Why? Because they would rather die than give it up. So the Jews were protected, but the Romans began to realize that the people who believe in Jesus are a little bit different than the people who practice Orthodox Judaism of the day. And so Christians began to face persecution in this era. And so the temptation for the people who were Hebrews was written to, was the temptation was to revert back to their original beliefs and walk away from their belief in Jesus Christ to find protection under the rule of the Roman Empire so that they would no longer face persecution. So that's why when we understand what Hebrews is about, it talks about Jesus being greater. It talks about having a greater high priest. That's why you don't want to go back. It talks about, listen, in 5th and 6th chapter, he says, you need to grow up. You need to mature. You need to understand that there's a process in which we grow in our understanding. Hebrews chapter 7 and chapter 8 talks about a greater temple, a greater tabernacle, a greater sacrificial system. Hebrews chapter 9 talks about Jesus again as our actual sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 10 talks about that persecution, saying you had things taken from you, your possession have been taken from you. They're coming into your homes, taking stuff from you in, in means of persecution, but do not forsake the assembling together. Don't trample underfoot what God has brought you to. And then Hebrews chapter 11 brings them to this place. Look at. let me give you an example. Throughout the entire Bible, there are people who through, because of their faith, had to walk a difficult journey and had to step out in faith. And that's why we call it the hall of faith. Proving that as we walk in faith, the journey will not always be easy. It will not always always be pleasant, but it will always be worth it. Ending in the 11th chapter, the people that, that lived their life and did not see their promises fulfilled. Why? Because God had something better. And then all of a sudden, those 11 chapters arrive and bring us to this place. Chapter number 12, chapter number 13, where we find ourselves literally at the tip of the iceberg, the star atop the Christmas tree, the crowning event of why this book was written is this, run your race. God's got a plan. He's got a place. He's got a position. He's got a lane for you to live. Don't go back to what you used to do. Run in your lane. And that's why it says, run, shed aside every weight and sin that so easily ensnares us. And let us what? Run with endurance the race set before us. Who? Looking unto Jesus, the one who went before us, the pioneer who went before us. And now from verse 3 through verse 11, with that in mind, the author who writes the book of Hebrews starts to speak of the subject of godly discipline. And so we're going to look at these verses. We're going to try to figure some things out as we look at what, uh, what that means for you and I. So go with me to Hebrews in the 12th chapter. We're going to read. We're going to read through a bunch of verses. And we're going to go through them uh, uh, shortly today. And, and over the next couple of weeks, we're going, to, we're going to focus on this. And I'm going to give you an overview. I'm, more than anything today, I pray that you catch the characteristics in the heart of God in the subject of discipline. And as we answer this question, Hebrews, uh, the 12th chapter, verse number 3. It says this, it says, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. Don't get weary. Don't get, don't get beat up about what's going on in your life. He says, listen, man, there, life is tough. Life is difficult. I, I know sometimes we want to paint this rosy picture that, you know, that once I found Jesus, ain't nothing bad ever going to happen to me for the rest of my life. But praise God, I have that happy day to stand on. Why? Because there are some good days and there are some bad days. 
So it says, don't, don't, get, don't get discouraged. Don't grow weary. Why? You have not yet resisted to bloodshed. You have not yet died in resisting or striving against sin. So before we even talk about the subject of godly discipline, I love what the author of Hebrews does. He says this. He says, look, it, before we even get into a hard subject, I want you to just to do something. I want you just to think about Jesus. You see, from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible at all points focuses and fixes on Jesus Christ. That's why he's the author and the finisher of our faith. And even regarding the subject of discipline, a subject that we don't like to hear, a subject and a question that we ask, is God punishing me? The author of Hebrews, before he even discusses it, says, before we even get into this subject, here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at Jesus. Why? Because you're going through hard times. Guess what? So did he. You see, he was persecuted. He was handed over to the authorities by his closest group of people. And he was nailed to a cross, innocent of a crime, to bear our sin and our shame. He understands what it is to live a hard life on this earth. Why? But the Bible says in John that, that Jesus Christ, the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. You see, he was, in Hebrew says, he was tempted in all points as we are what? It means Jesus lived the frailty of humanity and he understands what it is to live life here on earth in a fallen state and that when we are discouraged when we're wondering about bad things happening to us when we're wondering about pain and suffering and all these different things that we ask why God why he says this consider Jesus just remember if anything else Jesus went through what we go through he can empathize he can understand he's not some distant God in some distant realm he was here on earth breathing the flesh and breathing the oxygen that we breathe today here on earth Jesus Christ knows exactly what we're going through and the thing about it is when you think about it like this you probably don't remember because this was like four and a half years ago in Hebrews the fifth chapter we talked about Jesus and it says this it says even though Jesus was a son he learned obedience, learned obedience, learned obedience, what? Through the things in which he suffered. He knows exactly what it's like to go through a life of correction, to go through a life of suffering. He knows exactly what it's like to go through the life that you and I live. He can relate to you. What a wonderful concept that is. And so when we think about the subject of discipline and when we think about this question, is God punishing me? When we think about the, the subject of what does it mean to be disciplined, we need to understand this, that discipline, discipline is an important, it's an integral part of our development in life. You've been somewhere on earth, somewhere. You've been in a shopping mall, you've been in a restaurant, you've been at a park, you've been at a playground, you've been at a department store, you've been on the street, on the sidewalk, you have been at home and you have seen a child who was not disciplined. Now, it's not your kid. We know that, right? Y'all go to church, not your kid. You saw somebody else's kid who was undisciplined. And you saw him, you saw him running around, causing a buck, uh, you know, saying things they shouldn't be saying, spitting or licking or biting or punching or, or just, you know, causing all sorts of a ruckus. And you thought exactly the same thing the person next to you thought. You arrived at a conclusion immediately. And your conclusion was this. That kid just needs a good old-fashioned walloping. You see, discipline is an integral part of our development. Why? Because a parent would never allow their child, a loving parent, and maybe you don't have this, and that's how I say this. we look at discipline in the eyes and the lens of our experience, and maybe you didn't have a loving parent, maybe you didn't have a, a parent at all. But you see, discipline from a loving parent to a child is, is an act, it, it's something that we do, it's, it, it, it's important, it's, it, it's absolutely detrimental to our development. Why? Because a parent would not allow their child to go a wayward distance, to go a wayward way, knowing that it would eventually lead to destruction and chaos in their lives. Even though it might seem fun for the moment, they know the end result would be something that that child would regret. Would regret. So what do they do? They discipline their child so as to not allow them, to not let them, to not lead them down that path. Discipline is absolutely integral into our development. And here's the deal. God, in his great love for you and I, would not overlook our wayward tendencies. God in his great love for you and for I would not overlook 
our wayward tendencies. He will not look the other way when we are going down the path of destruction. Wayward tendencies. We could call it flesh. Paul the Apostle says in Romans, the seventh chapter, he says, listen, I find that there's this unexplicable war that I'm dealing with. There's this thing. I, the, the things that I want to do, he says, I, I don't know why I don't do those. And the things that I don't want to do, I can't explain why, but I seem to do the things I don't want to do. And the things that I want to do, I can't figure out why I'm doing it. And I find that there is a war, a battle within my own body. You see that the wayward tendencies of our flesh, our human desire, is to lead us down a path of destruction. But understand this, that godly correction, discipline, is integral to our development. And God would not, will not overlook our wayward tendencies because of his great love for us. And here's why we understand that. And here's why we see this. Now we get into these verses. Hebrews in the 12th chapter, look at now verse number five. It says this, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. What an amazing statement. You see, there are verses in the Bible, particularly verses in the New Testament, that are written to the world, which means that the world can take them at face value. Here's a great verse that's written to the world, John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world, right? God loves every person on earth. That's a world scripture. This is a verse that, that, that narrows the category down. It says, you have forgotten the exhortation of what I'm about to read to you, what I'm about to say to you, what I'm about to teach to you is not a scripture for the world. This is a scripture for people who believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, people who have been adopted into the family. And that's why it says you have been exhorted as sons. Now, that, now, girls, you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I am not a son. I am a daughter. Praise God. Well, girls have to be sons. Why? Because us men, we got to be the bride of Christ. <laughs> Deal with it. it. says, you have forgotten the exhortation that speaks to you as sons, a father to their child, a loving, uh, a loving, caring parent to their offspring. It says this. It says, my son, don't despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and he scourges every son he receives. See, I was quiet right there. That was the section of scripture I said, when you read that, you probably won't jump up and shout amen. Why? Because when we look at those words, they're a little bit scary. Can we be honest? Can we be real? When I read about the Bible speaking to me directly, I know that this isn't like, oh, this is Jesus talking to that other guy. No, this is Jesus talking to me, okay? When, when I read that, when, when I read that the Spirit of God's talking to me, and I see the word chasten, I see the word rebuke, and, and then there's that one word in verse number six, scourge. What a scourge. If you've ever seen The Passion, if you haven't seen The Passion, I'd recommend you see it, The Passion of the Christ. It was an amazing depiction of what Jesus went through to bear our sin and our shame. But in the scene, in the movie The Passion, Jesus is uh, chained to a post and they whip Jesus. Not only do they whip Jesus, they whip him with what's called a Roman scourge, or they call it the cat of nine tails. And it's a whip with metal barbs and glass and bone shards in the whip. So every time it slashed across you, it ripped or it cut into your flesh. Pastor Luke, that doesn't make me feel any better about that verse right now. Right. We look at that verse and we start to get a little bit intimidated about it, but this is where I believe today what I want to focus on before we even talk about how discipline comes, what it looks like, or anything like that, we need to focus on the attributes and the nature of what God is saying to each and every one of us who are in the body of Christ. It says, do not be discouraged when you find chastening, when you find rebuke, what is rebuke? Harsh reply back. I think of rebuke as Peter's high moment in Matthew, the 16th chapter, when Peter says, man, you're Jesus, you're the son of God. And, and, and Jesus looks to Peter and he's like, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. You are Peter, I say, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against. And I think of Peter like, that's right, boys. He said, me, what's up? Right? And then the very next conversation Jesus has with Peter, what does he do? He turns to Peter and he says, Get behind me, Satan. I thought I was the rock. <laughs> Rebuke, a hard response. It's not something that we look forward to. I mean, I can't wait to get rebuked by God today. Scourging. But you see, when we understand the character and the nature and the attributes of what God is saying to his people today, he's saying, Listen. I'm talking to you not as the world. I'm talking to you as kids. 
I'm talking to you as my children. And may, although you may not have had a loving father, although you may not have had a caring parent, I am talking to you about the greatest loving father that there is. Why? Jesus says it like this in Luke. Jesus says in Luke, he says, listen, you guys, you, you parents, you know. He says, you, you wouldn't give your child a piece of a, a rock if they asked for bread. You wouldn't hand them a live snake if they asked you for some fish. He says, if you know how to take care of your kids, how much more does your father in heaven desire to take care of you? You see, there is an image that is painted and depicted for us of God, a loving father. And this is a verse speaking to you and to me of our loving father saying, don't be discouraged when discipline comes your way. Why? Because it's it's detrimental, it's imperative, it's so important to your development. Ultimately, God wants to take you and I to a higher place in life. God will not overlook our wayward tendencies. What happens is in our day and age, in our culture, vocabulary is becoming more and more critical and important. We live in a world of political correctness. Don't say this word, say that word. Don't say it this way, say that way. And relatively speaking, English... Is a, is a young language. It hasn't been around for thousands of years, which means it's continually evolving, which means one thing when it meant one thing years ago might mean something different today. For example, however old you are, go back to the decade of your teenage years and you can find a word or a slang word that you used that was countercultural to what everything was. Me, a child of the 80s and 90s, it was bad. That's bad. My dad would be like, no, that's good. I'm like, no, dad, it's so good, it's bad. I don't understand. It's bad. God came up to me after the service today and he was like, hey, Pastor Luke, your sermon was bad. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, it's bad. I was like, oh, okay, okay, cool, thank you. <laughs> Our vocabulary is constantly changing. And so we ask this question, the question that everybody wants to know, is God punishing me? Well, we need to understand the character and the nature and the attributes of God. And by understanding that, let's add, understand what we're asking of. What is to punish? To punish is simply this. To punish is to impose or to inflict a penalty as retribution for an offense. You see, we have this viewpoint or this image of God that starts off with God as a God of wrath, God as a God of justice. There will be a day of reckoning. The vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Hundreds of years ago during the Great Awakening, one of the greatest preachers that America had ever seen, a man by the name of Jonathan Edwards, taught a sermon entitled Sinners of the Hand of an Angry God, in which he depicted the life of a sinner like a household spider and God, the owner of the house, holding that spider over the flame of a candle. And we've taken that image and we've applied that to our everyday lives and we say, God is punishing me. And when we look at the word punish, when we look at what punish actually is, you understand it's a legal term. It says to inflict or to impose a penalty as retribution, equalization, as the response to an offense. You think of it like this, in our own constitution, a right that we have is a lawful a trial. Why? So that we don't receive a penalty, punishment, undue of our crime or wrongdoing. A couple of years ago, my wife, my beautiful wife, Stacy, gorgeous, wonderful, love you to death. A couple of years ago, she got a ticket for texting while driving. I never got one. Um, I just want to say that. And they imposed upon her $174 fine. Why? Because they had determined the equalization, the penalty that is, in, in is, is equal to the crime or the misdemeanor of texting while driving would cost $174. It's an equalization. When I look at this and I think of the question, is God punishing me? God is a God of wrath. God is a God of justice. God, God cannot, he's so righteous, he cannot even look upon sin, the Bible tells us in the Old Testament. So God, therefore, must be punishing my sin. And the question we ask ourselves is, does God punish my sin? The answer is yes. Yes. But it may not be the way in which you think. See, the Bible tells us in Romans, the fifth chapter, Romans is probably one of the greatest theological substances in the New Testament. Paul just lays it out to the church of Rome. Romans in the fifth chapter, it says it like this. It says, God demonstrates his love towards us in that 
while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now you see, Romans in the sixth chapter tells us that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin, the equalization, the retribution, the punishment for sin is death. Uh, a young man I heard him recently preaching uh, to a group of college-age students, and uh, he was talking about it, and he, and he said this. He said, you know, I don't have a really good testimony like some of you. He says, I, I was born in a Christian household. I grew up in youth ministry. I, I read my Bible. I prayed all the time. I've loved God all my life, and, you know, I never drank. I never did drugs. I never smoked or never did anything like that, and so, you know, and I was thinking about it for a moment. I think sometimes we have this mentality, we have this understanding of the sinners in the hand of an angry God that, that I was really bad. And, and maybe I wasn't as bad as that person, but I was still a bad person. And, and maybe I wasn't bad enough, so then, then it wasn't bad. But, so we say, like, well, that person over there, they were, they were bad, but I was not as bad. So my punishment's not as severe. But you see, God did not send Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, to live amongst us, to, to, to teach us our ways, and then eventually to walk himself to a cross to become sin for us. He didn't do that for bad people. And I hope you grab a hold of this today. God did not send Jesus Christ to die for bad people. God sent Jesus Christ to die for dead people. Let us sink in for a minute. You see... It's not that you're good or bad. It's that the wages of sin is death. You're dead. In the eyes of God, you're separated. You're cast out. You are not a part of the family of God. God didn't send Jesus to die because you're a bad person. He sent Jesus to die because you and I were dead because of sin. And he wanted to, re uh, he wanted to pay the penalty for that. So the question is, does God punish my sin? Yes! He did it already. He did it already. 2,000 years ago, as Jesus walked to the, to the hill of Calvary, and he gave himself willingly, he says, nobody takes my life, I lay it down. Greater love is this, there is no greater love than a man who lays down his life for his friends. Jesus Christ, innocent of sin, the Bible says, was that became sin for us. Why? So that God could inflict, so that God could incite, so that God could impose retribution of an offense towards him, sin. So that your sin and that my sin would be punished upon the cross of Jesus Christ, which means the sin that you've committed was already dealt with in, in God's eyes. Oh, but Pastor Luke, but Pastor Luke, what, I'm trying to figure this out. So the sin that I committed is already dealt with. What about tomorrow if I mess up? You want to try to bake your noodle? Think about it like this. God forgave your sin 2,000 years ago. Which means you weren't even born and your sin was forgiven. And you really want to try to figure it out in Revelation. John says Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundations of the world. How does this all work? I don't know. God knows. But the question we ask when something happens to us is, I think God is punishing me. Does God punish sin? Yes, he already did it. Does God punish what's going to happen tomorrow? He already did it. What about 10 years from now? What if I still slip and fall and fall on my face? He already did it. Through the cross of Jesus Christ, our sin was punished. Retribution was paid for you and I. And so Romans says that he demonstrates his love that Jesus Christ died for us, for us while we were sinners. Now, I love what verse number nine goes on. It says, and it says, therefore, much more then. Now we've been justified just as if by his blood we shall be, look at this, saved from wrath through him. That whole angry God, God's mad at you. God's getting back at you. You messed up and he's settling the score with you. Oh boy, you really upset him now and I'll tell you what, his fury is coming upon you. Right there, the Bible tells us that we, because of Jesus Christ, remember I said that there are verses that are say, spoken to the world and there are verses that are spoken to believers. This is a message spoken to believers. That we, through Jesus Christ, are not appointed to the wrath of God. Why? Because it was already settled on the cross of Jesus Christ. The penalty, the punishment for your sin was already paid 2,000 years ago. 
which takes a big, heavy weight off of our shoulders where we can sit back, take a big, deep breath, and we can say, does God punish my sin? (sighs) He already did through Jesus Christ. Done. Finished on the cross. Which takes a big burden off of my heart, takes a big burden off of my life. But what happens is the pendulum starts to swing and we say, well, praise Jesus. My sin was already punished, which means I get to do whatever I want to do. Why? Because my sin was already covered. So it doesn't matter. God knows what I'm going to do tomorrow, but but he already paid for the price. So I don't got to do it. I love Romans in the 8th chapter. They call it Romans. They call Romans the 8th chapter, the great 8. Why? Because, man, it's like the summit of theology, right? Romans chapter 8, verse number 1. Paul the Apostle says this. He says, after just talking about this war in Romans chapter 7, I don't do the things that I should do. I do the things that I should not do. I can't figure out. I'm this wretched guy. What's going to happen? Who's going to save me from this? I thank the Lord for Jesus Christ. And then eight number chapter 8, number 1 comes on and he says, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's something that we get to celebrate out. But it does not say there is no correction. Oh! Why? Because in Romans, the 8th chapter, the grade 8, he says, for to be carnally minded, fleshly minded, to be minded in our wayward tendencies as humans is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You see, God and His great love for you will not overlook your wayward tendencies, you could put in parentheses, of the flesh for you. Why? Because the Bible says you've been exhorted as children. Don't be discouraged when you see about godly discipline. Why? Because God, as a godly parent, as a, as a loving father, here's what he wants. He wants to take you to a better place. He wants to take you to a greater level in life. And he will not overlook our wayward tendencies that would lead us in the opposite direction, but he will correct us and lead us into that place. Here's what God does. God does not punish our sins because our sins were already punished, but what God does do is he leads us into corrective action. Let me define to you what corrective action is. Corrective action is this. It's designed to correct or to counteract something harmful or undesirable. Now, when we understand the nature and the attributes of God, a loving father who wants the best for you, when he sees you, he sees his son. When he sees you, he sees love. When he sees you, he sees mercy. When he sees you, he sees grace. This is a father who pours out his love daily. His mercies are new every morning. This is the attribute of a loving father. What is it? Corrective action. An action designed to correct or to counteract something harmful or undesirable. He don't want you walking that path of destruction. He don't want you going down that place that's going to take you to places that you're going to eventually regret. He wants to take you to a higher place. He wants to take you to better things. He wants to bring you out from what you once were to a place and now you see and become and live and act in what you now are through Jesus Christ. A better place. There is no condemnation. Why? Because discipline is an act of love designed to take you to a better place. Discipline is an act of love designed to direct you to better things. God has better things in store for you. He's got a great plan. He's got a great future. He's got good things coming your way. And when we ask the question, is God punishing me? We can say my sin was already punished, but you know what? God loves me so much. He's not going to let me get away with my actions that are undesirable or dangerous in my life. Why? Because he wants me to run my race with endurance, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. Why? Because Jesus did it. He sat down at the right hand of the Father. He said, it is finished. It is done. Come on with me. God wants you to go to a higher place with Him. So discipline is an act of love of a father to their child, of a father to their child. Hebrews, going on, it says this. Look what it says. It says, verse number seven, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you're without chastening, 
which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. What does that mean? Let me, let, me, let me explain it to you like this. I've got two kids, Bjorn and Emma. My little daughter, Emma, she's a fireball. I mean, she's just full of energy, full of words, full of everything that we can't figure out where she got it from. We ask God on a regular basis, God, where did she come from? One thing, uh, one, one of the characters of, of my little girl, Emma, is that she's punctual, not punctual, punctual, in the sense that when she's upset, she's going to punch you. So as a parent who loves her, I respond in corrective action when I see this going down. And I pull her over and I say, Emma, listen here. Don't you punch people when you get upset. Just because you feel like you're mad doesn't mean that it's okay to hurt somebody else because you're hurting right now. And we correct her actions. Why? Because eventually that left unchecked will lead her down a path she will regret. And it's ultimately an act of love to bring her to a better place. But here's, a, here's an interesting story. A couple, of, a couple of months ago, we were all out playing, or the kids were all out playing. The parents were sitting on the periphery of a playground out of the park. And there's a bunch of kids playing, and Emma and Bjorn out there playing. And Emma comes running up to me crying, Daddy, 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 so-and-so hit me. So what do I do as a dad? Well, I whisper to her in her ear, go hit him back. But that's not what I'm trying to say. <laughs> what do I do? Let me ask it more like this. What do I not do? What I did not do is I did not walk over to that child on the other side of the playground in front of their parent and put them over my knee and spank them for hitting my daughter. Why? Because I'm not their parent. You see, I might like that kid, but I don't love that kid like mine. Or you can even say it like this. It's not my responsibility to discipline somebody else's kid. Since the Bible says that if you have chastening and if you endure chastening it's a sign it's not a sign of things that you're doing bad it's a sign of God loves you so much that he's taken upon himself the responsibility to lead you in corrective action in order to take you to a better place in life it is a privilege The Bible says it like this in Proverbs, the 13th chapter. The Bible says, uh, uh, Solomon's wisdom, he says it like this. He says, that the parents who love their children will discipline them promptly. Why? Because we don't want them to go down those wayward paths. And so we need to understand that discipline is God's act of great love towards us in the sense that we are now uh, children of the Most High God because of Jesus Christ. Now we have the freedom to love and to look at God and say, wow. What an honor it is that you care so much about me that you won't let me get away with my wayward tendencies anymore, but you'll lead me and direct me and correct me into the path that you want me to have. Why? For a better purpose in life. So amazing. So what do we do with godly discipline? Well, we, with the question remains, what is it? And we're going to talk about that in the weeks to come. What is it? But here's what I'm going to tell you. God does not discipline in the dark. Why? Because God's discipline, God's corrective action is designed purposely and soulfully for you to get on path and on track with what God wants you to do. So that if you're questioning, if you're wondering, God, what is going on? Are you trying to say something to me? God says, listen, ask me. I'll tell you why. Because I want you to know. He doesn't want you to try to figure it out over the course of your life. Well, I think. No, ask him. James chapter 1, verse number 5 says, if anybody lacks wisdom, let him ask of God in faith. And he'll receive liberally and without reproach a father who gives. You see, so God's desire for you in godly correction is for you to know and to understand. So what do we do when God's corrective action comes our way? Receive it and walk in it. Receive it and walk in it. Take it. Live in it. Uh, God's corrective action and walk in it. Why? Because his correction is always for your good. Always for your good. Look what it says in Hebrews. We'll finish these three verses right here. Furthermore, we've had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? Look what he says. For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them using their judgment. But he, God, for our profit, that we, look at this, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastising, no correction comes to be joyful or seems to be joyful for the present, but it's painful. Nevertheless, afterwards, look at what happens. It yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. You see, corrective action from God will always lead back to God's will. 
Godly correction, godly discipline will always take you to the will of God for your life. Why? Because God wants you to go to a higher place in life. He's got better things than you can even plan. That's why Ephesians 3 says that God is a God who is exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or think. You think you've got good plans? God says your good plans are nothing compared to my plans. Why? Because my ways are higher than your ways. My, my, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. I want to take you to a place that you can't even imagine, but you've got to do and listen to what I want you to do. Why? Because that's my will to get you there. So what do we do when godly correction comes our way? We receive it and we walk in it. Why? Because it always points back to the will of God. Paul the Apostle says it like this in, in 1 Corinthians in the 11th chapter. We talk about communion together. He's writing to the church and he says, listen guys, if you judge yourselves, you'd not be judged. If you use a little bit of discretion in your life, You'd not be judged. Can I just say it like this, 21st century terms? Can, can, I, can, I, can I get on my soapbox for a minute? No, I can't. Okay. He says, if you, judge, if you judge yourself, you'd not be judged. Can I get on my soapbox again now? Okay, I'm not, I'm not even going to ask you. I'm just going to do it. Let me just say it like this. Paul's saying, if you would just take ownership of your life, you'd not be judged. But look what he goes on and he says this word. He says, but when we are judged and chastened by the Lord... We're chasing, why? That we may not be condemned with the world. So God wants to bring you to a higher place. And so often, and we'll talk about this in the weeks to come, so often corrective action looks so much like consequence. But let me tell you something. Just like there's a law of gravity. What does gravity say? What goes up must come down. It's a law. Can't escape it. Can't get away from it. Unless you leave the planet. There is a law in God's word and in God's kingdom. And that law is... What you sow, you will reap. Paul says in Galatians, you sow things according to the flesh, you'll reap things according to the flesh. You sow things according to the Spirit of God, guess what? You're going to get it back. Things according to the Spirit of God. What you sow, you reap. And so often correction seems to be or looks just like consequence. To finish where I started, I heard a man say, Pastor, I think God is punishing me. And I don't know why. My wife left me. I lost my job. And my friends don't even want to talk to me anymore. What is going on? Come to find out they had a rocky marital relationship. And she showed up at his job one day. And he lost his temper. And he punched her. So she left him. He did it on the job. So he got fired. And his friends at work saw him do it and don't want to be associated with an abuser. So often, consequence appears to be corrective action. Either way, own it. Own it. Why? Because Paul says if you just own your life, if you wouldn't take your life's responsibility and place it on somebody else, place it on the government, place it on your parents, place it on your family, place it on your friends, place it upon the church, place it upon all your problems, on somebody, if you would just own your life, judge yourself, you'd not be judged. And even when you are, God does it to, to bring you to a place, a better place. Why? So that you'd not be condemned with the world. See, godly discipline is a difficult subject for us to understand, but we need to understand that God and his great love for you and I will not overlook our wayward tendencies towards him. And discipline is an act of love from God towards us. What? To bring us to a higher place. And it will always take us to the will of God in our lives. Listen, God's not going to give your wife cancer. He's not going to make your kids sick because he's trying to punish you. Why? Because your sin was already punished. That is not the character and the attributes of God. Corrective action to counteract your life, to do something to get your attention, to bring you to a place of pleasurable and peaceable results. Why? So you could be partakers in his holiness, so that you could learn from the peaceable fruit of righteousness, and you could live after being trained by it in the will and in the ways of God. Why? So that you can do exactly what God wants for you, to live in a better place in life. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you and we thank you for your word. As challenging as it might be for many of us, most of us, all of us, Lord, I pray today that those of us who are in this place wondering and questioning, God, are we facing discipline or are we facing punishment in our lives for things that we've done? Lord, first and foremost, I pray for peace. Why? Your word says that the peace of God, our Christ that surpasses understanding, would guard our hearts and our minds. So, Father, I pray for peace as we ask for you. 
Lord, I pray for uh, comfort from the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray for wisdom as we ask and as we seek after you. Lord, may we have the heart of David that says, Lord, search my heart. Reveal the iniquity that is within me. Do not remove me from the presence of your Holy Spirit. God, as we see that, as we ask for you to reveal that in our hearts so that we might live more according to your wills, Lord, more, more according to your way, Lord, that we might look upon Jesus as our example and try to follow that. God, I pray that you would lead us and guide us into your will and into your wind, that you would take us to those places that you so desire for each and every one of us to go. In Jesus' mighty name. We all said? Amen. 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 The next couple of weeks, we'll talk about discipline, what it is, how it comes, what it looks like, things of that nature, so there'll be more to come with that. So if you need some clarity, come back next week. We'll discuss that again. But before we leave today, I want to take just a quick moment, just a real quick moment to talk to you about that. See, I talked about the subject of godly discipline and God's love for you to lead you to a place. God wants you to go to a higher place. Listen, that message is for people who believe and follow after Jesus Christ. It's like the mass exodus. Hey, hey, the Red Sea's not parting yet. It's not time to leave Egypt. Stick around. Don't get up. Don't be rude. I'll let you out in just a minute, guys. There's lots of people. Come on. Respect the person next to you. This might be the moment that changes their life. You see, we can't just come and think, well, you know what? God loves me so much that he's going to lead me to higher places. Because the Bible is very clear, yet culture takes us in such a different direction than what the Bible is directing us to. So often we think, you know what, I have a sense of spirituality. I, I, I don't necessarily buy into that Christian message anymore or whatever, this and that. I, I've been burned by that. I believe that there is a God. I believe that there's something that I believe that we all find that sense of spirituality. And we can call it God or whatever you want to do, but we'll all find ourselves in the same place. But let me tell you something. Despite what our culture, despite what our society wants to bring us to, all roads don't leave. Lead to heaven. All roads don't leave to the place of being in position and in right standing with God, in which you and I are no longer appointed to the wrath of God, but now appointed to the love and to the desires of God's will. That doesn't happen just because you hope so. That doesn't happen, listen, because you attend church. That doesn't happen because you categorize yourself within a religion such as Christianity or Catholicism. It does not happen like that. Why? Because God's not interested in, in good thoughts. God's not interested in outward actions or self-help. God's not at, interested in categorization or religions. He's interested in you. And he's interested in your soul. You see, he sent Jesus Christ to die on a cross for you and for me because our sin had a price to pay. And without that sin being paid for, you and I would never be called children of God, only enemies. But it's through Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus said these words. He said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And he said, no one goes to the Father except through him. You see, you can't find God because of a positive outlook. You can't find God because of good deeds. You can't find God because of sitting in church and listening or tuning out and, and, and attending every Sunday or every other Sunday or once a year or once a month, whatever it might be. That's not how you find God. Jesus said it like this. You find God through me. I'm the gate. I'm the door in which you travel through in order to be connected and be in right standing with God. Jesus said it like this. How do we do that? He said it like this. He said, in order to be, in order to inherit the eternal kingdom or eternal life. What does that mean, inheritance? Inheritance is for somebody who's brought in. It's an inheritance is for somebody who's on the inside. In order to have that position, he says, you must be born again. What does it mean to be born again? It's not what you think. It's not what Hollywood's made it out to be. Weirdo, crazy, out of control Christianity. Listen, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing in the heart and the eyes of God. It means that you've given God all of your heart. It means that you've given God all of your life. It's all or nothing relationship with God the Father through his Son, Jesus Christ. It's a dedication of your life to Jesus. You see, it's not about your mental ascent or your carnal knowledge of who Jesus is. It's about your heart and your connection to God. Why? Because God is interested in you. And you know exactly who you are. When you wake up in the morning and you look at yourself in the mirror and you look beyond the makeup and you look beyond the hairstyle and you look beyond the clothes and you look beyond the facade and you look beyond the friends and the Facebook followers and you look down in the depths of who you are, you know exactly who you are. And that's the you God sent Jesus for. To fill you from the bottom up, from the depths of your soul to the heights of your soul with his love, his desire, his will for your life. You see, Jesus said it like this. He says, I have come to this earth that you would find life and have it more abundant. And that's not always equated with money and things and possessions. But he says, when you look into the depths of who you are in the mirror in the morning, or before you go to bed at night, he says, I, I pray, I came, so that you would look at that person and you say, you know what? I am fearfully and wonderfully made in the eyes of God because he loves me. 
And the only way to experience that, the only way to be brought in, the only way to become a child of God is to give and surrender your life, your heart to Jesus Christ, to be born again, as Jesus put it. See, the Bible says in the book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking to his churches, and John is writing this letter, and Jesus says in the book of Revelation, he says, listen, I know you. I know what you're doing. I know your works. He says, I'd rather find that you're hot. I'd rather find that you're cold. He says, if I find that you're lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. And it's like a shocking statement out of the mouth of Jesus. See, what he's saying is that lukewarm Christians aren't real Christians at all. They're going to be rejected, ejected from the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be lukewarm? It means that you're not up, you're not down, you're not in, you're not out. You've got occasional church attendance doing some of your own thing, doing some of God's thing. You're not wholehearted for God. You're not wholehearted against God. Maybe disenfranchised or disassociated with the things of God. But you say, I believe that there's some principle out there. Jesus says, listen, I love you enough to tell you, to rebuke you, to tell you. But then he gives them the answer. And he says, listen, oh, I wish that you'd just come to me. I wish that you'd wear the, clothes, the, the robes of righteousness that I want to put on you. He says, listen to this. He says, he says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. He says, if you just open up the door of your soul, open up the door of your heart, I'll come in and we'll have communion together. We'll have relationship together. I'll fill you from the depths of your soul to the heights. But it comes by surrendering yourself to God to allow him to do what he will in your life. Jesus said these words. He says that if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his father. But if you deny him, he said he will deny you. Today I want to give you that opportunity. And here's what we're going to do in just a moment. Just a moment, we're going to pray a prayer of salvation together. And I'm going to invite you to be a part of that prayer. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to, in a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'll go like this. I'll go one, two. And on the count of three, I'm going to go three. And I'll smack my hands together real loud. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to pop your hand up. What you're doing by the raising your hand, you're saying, you know what, Pastor Luke, today, that prayer, I, I, want, I want to be included in that prayer. I, I want to give my heart. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. That, that's, I feel like you're talking to me. I can feel the Spirit of God knocking on my heart right now, and I feel like I need to respond to that invitation. That's what you're doing. You see, I'm a man. I'll see your hand. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. Right after that, what we'll do is I'm going to have you come, and I want to come up here and shake your hand, and I'm going to pray with you right here to receive Jesus Christ and let your life begin to change right here, right here, now. Who should raise your hands if you've never given your heart, you've never given your life to Jesus? If that's you in just a moment, get ready. If you're not sure, don't walk out of here without making sure. You see, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Come to turn the light on in the darkness. God doesn't want you groping around in the darkness, hoping, wondering, well, I think I'm right with God. He says, I've given you my spirit to live on the inside of you so that you would know without a shadow of a doubt who you are. If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing today, if that's you, don't walk out of this place without making sure, without solidifying your position with God. Listen, it's not a church game. It's not just a church thing. God did not send Jesus to die on a cross naked for our sin so that we could play games, so that we could just play church. It's real. And let's get real with God today. I'm going to ask everybody to do this today. I'm going to ask you if you would just, would you do me a favor and give the person next to you, behind you, in front of you a moment of intimacy with God. I'm going to ask if you would just close your eyes for a moment. Bow your heads. and, Like Paul says in Corinthians, examine yourself. Judge yourself. Look at yourself. Own your life. If you're to be honest with yourself, are you in right standing with God today? Or is the Spirit of God knocking on the door of your heart today? And as your eyes are closed and your head is bowed and you're thinking about that, I want you to have a moment with God. If that's you today and the Spirit of God speaking to you, I want you to just pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. And we'll pray together right after that. You ready? I'm going to count to three all across this auditorium. If that's you, you pop your hand up. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place. If that's you today, you want to give your heart to Jesus Christ. I see you in the back. I see you back over there. If that's you in this place today, I see you back over there. I see you way over there in the back. I see you over there. All right, I see you over here. That's you. You say, oh, that's me. I feel like God's speaking to my heart right now. And I want to respond. If that's you in this place today, pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge you. Put it right back down. If that's you today. All right, I see you back over there. Usher's pointing at you. Good. Anybody else in this place? Say, man, I wonder if that's me. Come on. Don't neglect and don't reject the invitation of the Holy Spirit in your life right now to come and to find life with Jesus Christ. Anybody else in this place today? Well, here's what we're going to do for the sake of time. Those of you that raised your hands and those of you that did not raise your hands, but maybe you should have raised your hand. Here's what I'm going to do. I, want, I said I'm going to pray with you. Now we're going to do that together. We're going to pray that prayer. And I want to, I want to shake your hand. I want, to, I want to congratulate you. I want to get some information into your hands today. And so we're going to pray that prayer together. This is your appointment with God. So in a moment, we're all going to stand up. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, here's what I want you to do. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, uh, your purse, a friend, if you need a friend, family member, bring your umbrella with you. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Come meet me right here at this altar. I want to shake your hand, and I want to pray right now with you a prayer of salvation to invite Jesus Christ into your heart, into your life. So let's all stand together. If you raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand, wherever you're at, if that's you in this place, come on, come meet me right here. Let's change destinies together. I give my life to you. I give my
That's you. Come on. Wherever you're at, this is your moment. Shake your hand. Just hang on right here. We're going to pray together. Come on, brother. Hey, right on, my man. If that's you, come on. If you responded to the invitation of Jesus into your life. This is your moment. Wherever you're at, come on. They're still coming. We'll wait for you. You're worth waiting for. If that's you, come on. so cool you guys came and I just want to tell you congratulations congratulations why because you're making a great decision you know Jesus tells this story he says that there's a shepherd that has a hundred sheep 99 of them are good but one of them goes and gets lost in the wood he says would that shepherd not leave all 99 good sheep to go chase after that one that got lost and when he finds that one lost sheep would he not put it over his shoulders and celebrate with everybody around him for the one that he found that was lost and then he goes on and he says that is God to you see heaven right now is celebrating on your behalf why because you're making the decision to return and to come to Jesus. What a wonderful decision. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray a prayer today. I'm going to ask you just to repeat after me. And all of you that are in this auditorium today, I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer after me as well. If you're at home watching online and you want to pray that prayer and invite Jesus into your life, simply repeat this prayer after me and let's believe together. I believe everything's going to change in your life. So let's all bow our heads, close our eyes one more time. Let's pray this prayer. Everybody today, repeat these words after me today, all right? Father God, I come to you today and I acknowledge that I need you. I give my life, I give my heart to Jesus Christ. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me of my past. And take control of my future. Today, I dedicate my life to Jesus Christ. I'm a Christian, headed for heaven, leaving hell behind. I am a follower of Jesus. Fill me today with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name. Praise God. Hey, guys, really quickly. See this guy right over here? His name's Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is going to take you guys just right over there. Listen, nothing weird goes on. I promise. Here's what he's going to do. He's going to introduce somebody that will pray with you, that will connect with you. He's going to give you some free information, some literature to help point you in the right direction for the rest of your life. The third thing he's going to do is he's going to invite you to come back, hang out. We want to get you connected. We'll buy you a cup of coffee, teach you some things about the Word of God to get you strong in the ways of God. So if you guys just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with Pastor Joel.